Mohamed Yarov plays Shock, Ing Chess to win in Shamkir. Alexandra and I discuss the ugly topic of sexism in chess. Mike Klein reveals what Gary Kasparov's latest book on machine intelligence might have in store for you. And Magnus Carlsen once again makes news outside of the chess world like nobody else can. Now hosted by Jimmy Neutron, it's Chess Center. Yeah, it was Magnus in two of our news reports uh, this week. Um, first one uh, was because he was uh, actually part of the Milken Institute's Global Conference 2017 in uh, LA. It was a four-day conference themed uh, Build Meaningful Lives. Magnus was a part of a, a side program uh, where he uh, gave a simul and an interview. And at this conference were some very famous names uh, present, actually, such as uh, George W. Bush, uh, Joe Biden, J.J. Abrams, musician Moby, for example. And uh, a certain Danny Wrench and uh, Eric Alabest of Chess.com. Uh, Danny, you uh, you were actually giving a commentary to that simul. Before I mentioned that in the interview, uh, he, he said some very interesting things. So you can read Mike's uh, news report on that. The one quote I want to uh, put out is, uh, the best way of learning to deal with defeat is not to lose. A nice one from Magnus there. Yeah, and that clock simul watched by 250 very interested uh, uh, spectators. He won it 9 to 1, uh, very impressively, or 10 minutes only on the clock for everyone, also himself. Uh, he only lost one game because he actually forgot that that game was still going on. Yeah, Danny, tell, tell us uh, maybe a little bit about uh, you being there. Yeah, I'm uh, always impressed by Magnus's ability to do things like that on site. And people think we're joking when we say it's a challenge. But 10 minutes for 10 boards, it was a feat to watch and a pleasure to be a part of the event. But that's not all the world champion did with Chess.com this week. No, absolutely, because to everyone's surprise, uh, he actually also signed up uh, for uh, on the very next day for our uh, Title Tuesday tournament. I want to stress that uh, Chess.com is not paying him, uh, we're not even asking him. Uh, he just uh, shows up, uh, he wanted to play this tournament, and uh, after three hours he uh, emerges the, the very convincing winner, as a world champion should do. He won the uh, tournament 9.5 out of 10. For example, Hikaru Nakamura finished on 8 out of 10, shared second. So. Another uh, big, uh, big win for, uh, for the world champ. Simon, just how should the kids break down a solid king side these days? Well, every kid needs Freddy the F-Pawn. And in this position, Freddy the F-Pawn plays a very important role. It opens up the white king here. I mean, this is a particularly strong because all the white's pieces are stuck over on the queen side. F4 is a fantastic move. And then if we go a couple of more moves down the line, queen B1, capture on G3. And now when the black rook swings over to F6, we can see just how much pressure is against the white king. And the final blow after bishop takes E4 is the black queen coming into D6, attacking that pawn on G3, which can't be defended in a good way. So very nice attack. And remember, kids, you have to use Freddy your friendly F-pawn. More lessons for the kids. Here we see that in a kind of boring position, Black maybe has more control over the critical B-file, but Sasha Grishuk says that wasn't the case. What move did he play here? Well, this was an amazing bolt out the blue here. I mean, it does look like a rather dull position, as you say, Danny, but all of a sudden, White plays Rook to B5. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. And that move is a great way to destroy the coordination of Black's pieces. And now after Black takes on A1, we take on B8, we can see all of a sudden that White has this pressure against the Black King. And here... We can see a couple more moves come by and white goes on to rip that king open and basically start a devastating attack against that naked black king. Finish it off in fine fashion, Grishik did, but no finishes were more fine than Shakir Mohamed Yarov's game here. He just won the Sham Kir Memorial for the second year in a row and uh, in, this, in this position just blew open the white king with a crushing attack. This is, this is a beautiful game. And after knight takes f3, a lovely sacrifice. I mean, we can see that white's king is simply ripped apart. I mean, you know, black is like a raging wolf here. And he's looking at the meat. And the meat is that white king. And there's really nothing that white can do. He has to take that knight because of threats of queen h2. And now the bishop comes in. Bishop to e5. This is a kind of peace well, space clearing sacrifice, and the queen's going to dive in, delivering checkmate. Lovely stuff. The chess world was featured in the Huffington Post this week for the wrong reasons, Alexandra, because a 12 year old Malaysian girl was discriminated against and then banned by a tournament director because of the dress she was wearing. Your thoughts on this sad story? 
The story was terrible from any angle. The arbiter's behavior was unacceptable. I hope that this doesn't affect the girl's future or her self-esteem, and that the virality of the story helps prevent things like this from happening in the future. This story is really sad, and it shines light on the bigger issue of female discrimination in chess culture. I think everyone can agree with the fact that this was just unacceptable, but there's a lot of smaller things that also go, go unnoticed and undiscussed in the chess community. You have girls who are six years old, they're playing with their chess their male counterparts and they're told, oh, it's easier to play you because you're a girl. Girls in high school who, when they go to chess events, they're told that they're only there to meet boys because the gender ratio is so good. And even more advanced females who get tournament invitations are told things like, you're only here for the nice conditions. You're not really here because you like chess. I'm sad that this happened. I'm glad that it got attention so it doesn't happen again in the future. But this is also the start of a conversation that I think we have to be having more often if we really want more women in chess. It's not every day that a lowly international master might have a chance to draw or beat the world champion, but international master Bellasine did have that chance and he blew it right here. Tell everybody what he did, Robert. Well, Danny, here he went rook a1, which seems natural getting your rook behind a passed pawn, but it allowed Magnus Carlsen to go knight f3, and after a6, knight e1, a great move cutting the rook off from the promotion square. Instead, he should have started the position with rook g1. Now knight f3 simply hangs the pawn on g2, so black would have been forced to try to bail out and make a draw. So a huge blunder by the international master. Absolutely. Now, speaking of huge blunders, our qualified challenger, Gregorians, he didn't have his best title Tuesday in May. Tell everybody how he self-made it in this position. Well, here, Danny, the move king to e6 for white just holds the balance and everything should be settled for a draw. Instead, he went rook c8 check first, allowing king d7, simultaneously attacking the rook on c8 and taking away the king's only square on e6, and rook f4 checkmate is next. He resigned on the spot. Now, speaking of being put on the spot, Magnus Carlsen was at the Milken Global Conference in Los Angeles, but whether the simul challenge was difficult with only 10 minutes for 10 games or not, he still completely forgot about one board and committed our third blunder of the week. Robert, have you ever just butchered a simul in that way? No, Danny, I can't say that I have. I've lost some excruciatingly bad games, but I've never just forgotten that a game was underway. The FIDE Grand Prix cycle rolls on. Here to tell us what we might expect at the next leg in Moscow is Grandmaster Robert Haas. Well, Danny, what happens in the UAE doesn't necessarily stay in the UAE. And those 140 Grand Prix points won by Alexander Grishuk, Maxime vachet Lagrave, and Shak Mamadjarv are coming with them into the Moscow leg of the Grand Prix cycle. I expect much of the same in Moscow. Alexander Grishuk and Shak Mamadjarv are two of the hotter players on the planet. Mamed Jarv in particular, he won in Shamkir. He's doing extremely well in the Russian team championship and for the first time in his life has crossed the 2790 threshold. There may not be any 2800 players in Moscow, but there will definitely be fighting chess. So expect lots of draws. But in the end, I do expect Grishuk and Mamed Jarv to be atop the standings, even though players like Hikaru Nakamura will try to stand in their way. Everyone can look for our breakdowns at chess.com slash news every day as this event keeps going and look for Grandmaster Robert Hess to bring you Game of the Day analysis. Top Aziri Grandmaster Shakri Yarmadiarov just defended his title on home turf by winning in Shamkir again. Does he not get enough love in the chess world? He doesn't get enough love for his exciting attacking approach to the game and look for him to join the 3 P club next year. Speaking of not getting enough love, were you surprised that slow chess players playing 10 minutes are actually playing more games than almost all the other time controls combined on chess.com? I'm shocked I've never played a single game of game 10, but you know what else I want to see gain popularity? Let's get some more three chess players. Go read my chess.com article and maybe you'll be inspired. And Danny, a recent Forbes article makes the claim that it's easier than ever to be a chess player. Do you agree with the conclusion? More tournaments for the world's top 20 to win big cash and more opportunities for guys like us, non-professional players, to do things like this online. More and more online lessons happening every day. So yeah, I'm buying the article. Are you buying that the most adorable thing is kids in suits and even better, kids in suits giving back to other kids through chess? Love them both, but you know what's the best? Kids in suits playing chess with cats in their lap. Let's make that happen. <laughs> Danny, a few months ago, we released our cap system. We got a little bit of flack for it, but do you feel vindicated that some other sites are trying to reproduce our results now? 
People said we were crazy when we started measuring people by their accuracy, not their results. But a new article at ScienceDaily.com shows that they're trying to do the same thing. Chess base has jumped into the fray, but just wait, fans, until you see our next experiment showing you who the greatest attacking players were of all time, according to our system. Finally, Mike, sticking with the topic of machines and chess, Gary Kasparov's new book delves deeply into the topic. What can you tell us about Gary's new take on machine intelligence? Well, it's been exactly two decades since he lost to Deep Blue, and I can tell you that I was with Kasparov last month. Can't explain exactly where I was or what I was doing, but his thoughts have mellowed about the match. He's not quite as upset as IBM. This is finally his tell-all. We're going to hear all about his take on the match and its implications. I can't wait to read it. It's not every day you might have a chance to draw or beat the world champion. And Bellasine, Bellasine, Aria Bellasine, <laughs> spaghetti. <laughs> Is that how you say his name? I have no idea, but every time you say it, I just want to be like, spaghetti. <laughs> Give me the meatball, Bellasine. <laughs> Over 20 points, jumped into the 2790s after winning Shamkir in honor of Gashir. Uh, okay, I went way too long. I'm going to try to. I don't think that was. A Bilal Bellasine. The Bellasine. All right. All right. Focus time. Here we go. Starting in three, two, one. It's not every day you might have a chance to draw or beat the world champion in Bellasine. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it again. <laughs>